Hello and welcome to the fifth and penultimate session of the Aspen Global Congress on Scientific Thinking and Action. My name is Aaron Mertz. I'm the director of the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program. And I'm Natalia Pasternak. I'm the founder and president of the Institute Question of Science in Brazil. This Congress has been a meeting of around 100 science communicators and advocates from over 50 countries. And we've been exploring over the past few days how we can work on stronger strategies to implement scientific thinking action in our local and global communities. Vaccines, obviously, even before the pandemic and especially now, are at the forefront of many people's minds when communicating science to the public. And we're thrilled to offer this panel today called Defeating Vaccine Hesitancy Through Communication. And I'm honored deeply to introduce our session chair, Professor Agnes Biniguajo is a Rwandan pediatrician who returned to Rwanda in July 1996, two years after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Since then, she has provided clinical care in the public sector, served the Rwandan health sector from 2001 to 2016 in high-level government positions, first as the Executive Secretary of Rwanda's National AIDS Control Commission, then as Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Health, and five years as Minister of Health. She co-founded the University of Global Health Equity, an initiative of Partners in Health, which focuses on changing how healthcare is delivered around the world by training global health professionals who strive to deliver more equitable quality health services for all. She serves as the university's vice chancellor. She is specialized in emergency pediatrics, neonatology, and the treatment of HIV AIDS. Professor Biniguajo also currently serves as a senior advisor to the D Director General of the World Health Organization and is a member of multiple advisory board and board of directors, including the Rockefeller Foundation Board. She is a member of a number of international working groups and task forces in global health through the United Nations and independent organizations, and also sits on the editorial board of several scientific journals and serves on multiple scientific commissions. Dr. Biniguajo, it's an honor to be here with you and I'll hand it over to you to kick us off with our panel. Thank you, Aaron, for this kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, wherever you are around the world, because I know that all continents are watching uh, this uh, great um, gathering. It is a pleasure for me to be sharing this session on vaccine denialism in the Aspen Global Congress on Scientific Thinking and Action. We all know during the, la the past 14 months, we have seen how widespread mixed communication, and miscommunication is a kind word because it's purposely sometimes wrong communication, have been an obstacle to the effective control of the spread of COVID-19 pandemic. This massive wrong information has given more impetus to the anti-vaccine group that have become more virulent than ever across the world, especially in the Western world, but also in parts of the world like in Africa. In my point of view, this is the result of global leaders who have politicized simple tools such a mask, as well as facts such as scientific discoveries cultivating the fake illusion that scientific evidence are useless. A prime example is the suggestion that what cleans and disinfects surfaces of table can clean and disinfect your mouth, your stomach, and your lung. I do an allusion to nobody, and anyone who recognizes him or herself is purely circumstantial. While we may laugh and find this funny, the spread of inaccurate information by such top global leaders through social media platform or through direct official speeches, as well as their contribution to vaccine hesitancy and the refusal of wearing masks across the world have been and are still the best ally of the deadly virus. With this in mind, it is no surprise that countries that select leaders who do not trust science and don't acknowledge the reality of COVID-19 have the highest number of deaths 
except of course in some poor, very crowded uh, part of the world. Additionally, my talk about the side, the, the many talks about the side effect of vaccine, where it's side effect that happen to people alive and keep them alive, despite the benefit outweighing the side effect. What are, are we talking about here? when in reality, it's about saving life. We are not letting people die. And we forgot that the worst side effect in life is death. We all need to continue to fight against this pandemic to return to the state of normalcy sooner than later. We need to determine how the, to challenge this wrong perception of the pandemic, the disease and of vaccine. And in order to assure that the evidence-based intervention effectively slow down and stop the spread of the disease, it's true, especially for vaccine, which remain the most efficient prevention tool for any outbreaks or pandemic. Now that vaccines are available since months in high-income countries and since few weeks in some low- and mid-income countries, more than ever, we need to explore the important topic of this panel. Today, we will do that through pair interviews, small group discussions, and a whole group debrief with experts in the field. Before we dive into the discussion, I want to introduce the great panelists I am so honored to chair today. First, we have Kevin Senapati. Kevin is a writer, journalist, and speaker covering science, health, food, and parenting. Her writing appear in many outlets, such as Slate, Self, Forbes, to, to name a few. She's also the co-founder of and contributing editor at scimom.com. She is a proud science mom and is featured in the new documentary science moms about moms seeking to raise their children with facts greater than the fear so common in the parenting world today. Our second panelist is Farah Ndiaye. Farah is an advocate and public policy specialist. She is the deputy executive director of Speak Up Africa a policy and advocacy action tank based in Dakar, Senegal, with a passion for public health and sustainable development and partnership building, Farah strives to ensure that policymakers met implementers, that solutions are showcased, and that every sector from individual citizen and civil society group to global donors and business leaders contribute critically to the dialogue and strive to form the blueprint for concrete action for public health and sustainable development. Third, we have Dr. Noel Brewer. Dr. Noel is professor of health behavior at the University of North Carolina. He has published over 300 research paper on why people engage in vaccination, and other health behavior, and is one of the most cited researcher in the world. His increasing vaccination model is in use by the World Health Organization, CDC, and other groups. He has advised the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, the President's Cancer Panel under two presidents, and various other federal and global agencies. Media coverage of his research include the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the BBC. Last, but certainly not the least, we have Ovidiu Kovaciu. Ovidiu Kovaciu is a scientific education activist and vaccine advocate in Romania, where he managed the largest pro-vaccine group on social media. He has also funded the Healthy Romania Coalition, 
an initiative dedicated to education via infographics. The image created have reached over 10 million views. A video also funded the Romania Rationalist Society, an NGO dedicated to critical thinking and science education. Since 2010, he has been the co-producer and host of Septic in Romania, a podcast show dedicated to promoting critical thinking. Now that we know our panelists of the session, we will start off with a pair interview. And first, Dr. Noel will interview a video. Ta up to you, Noel and Ovidio. All right, hi folks, uh, and welcome Ovidio. I'll start the first question with just some general terms, trying to get us oriented here. When we talk about vaccine hesitancy, and we talk about uh, that anti-vaccine activists, are those really the same things or are they meaningfully different? They are significantly different. Um, though they do interlap. So the um, maybe the best uh, definitions are like something like this. A person who is hesitant will look for better information, will try to get proper information and will try to understand it uh, as much as they can. Um, and if uh, well, let's say, well guided and well talked to, he can be swayed uh, to, to, to accept vaccinations. Uh, if they're initially on the on the fence, and that depends on uh, many ways to talk to them, um, ident finding them at the right time, even uh, and um, listening properly, and, and making sure that we that those that do the convincing um, convince the in, the in the right manner. While anti-vaccine activists are um, highly unreachable, uh, sadly. And uh, they thrive on the, let's say, community that an anti-vaccine group uh, builds and simply reinforce that me their messages internally, um, maybe identify new uh, things to be afraid of as time passes uh, and, um, and, and some, um, try, to, try to, let's say, belong and make sure um, they are well accepted in the group by spreading the information they, they come across that is anti-vaccine. And this is where I think the, the chasm lies between the two. Uh, while those that are, are on the fence um, can swing either way, I think there's a specific point, and at least I do that, that difference <laughs> for, for the people I see online, um, is um, the difference is when you start spreading misinformation. You may not know it's misinformation, of course, but if you actively spread something that is, um, or you are being told is misinformation, then you're making that step towards becoming more anti-vaccine. Um, and that is probably the, um, the, the time when the person becomes unreachable in, in, in many ways. I like this distinction that you make. <clears throat> There's a recent paper in, in Nature that identifies that people don't really, well, most people uh, don't intentionally spread misinformation. However, of course, anti-vaccine activists do. They do that through social media primarily. Uh, however, once people are asked to look at the and evaluate what they're looking at more carefully, just take a look and be sure, it cuts sharing of misinformation by half. So that's very positive, but there's still some confusion there. Uh, the other half is mostly due to people misunderstanding. So what can we do about this, this misinformation that's being hosted by these social media platforms? Uh, of course, we can try to intervene as individuals and activists as our, ourselves. Do you think there are legal recourse here? Should we be trying to limit what these companies can do or penalizing them in some way? Well, um, it depends a bit on what we want to achieve. Uh, of course, and, uh, social media companies know very well that um, engaging content, and I put that in quotes, uh, drives, um, drives more views. And that's what they, they want to get out of their platforms. Um, and, um, and that also brings along money. Uh, there is a specific study uh, for, from 
the Center for Digital Hate, I think, for countering digital hate, um, which says that Facebook and probably Instagram as well have together um, made about $2 billion from anti-vaccine misinformation. From the impact they are providing and of course the ads that can be used to, to target people. So there is a money incentive and removing that, that financial incentive is, is one way um, to, to do it. And I, but I think we are, let's say, uh, too far gone. <laughs> to save uh, social media as the algorithm uh, it has built has become un un unwieldable. And um, uh, maybe the, I mean, initial social media companies do not, did not use the, let's say top stories or promoted stories or did not use this, uh, um, let's say algorithm based uh, information. They would give you a chronological, uh, chronological um, uh, history of the posts. And when they grow, they start changing that algorithm from chronology to let's see what's popular around the interwebs and show it to whoever many people we can show it to. Um, and that change, that is what drives misinformation because as far as we would want to push it, um, scientific information is not that engaging. It's interesting, it's educational, but it's not sexy. It doesn't drive clicks, it doesn't drive... Um, um, let's say, um, controversy. So it's very hard to push, put in front of people, let's say, put a video of someone explaining vaccination to two people arguing for some, you know, reason or, or a funny video, you know, the sign, the guy who's doing science is gonna, is gonna, is not gonna be successful. That's a really important point. Scientists are bringing pencils and pocket protectors to a firefight. We don't have the right tools. Personal stories are very powerful. What have you found effective in your own work in advocating for vaccines to counter anti-vaccine narratives and anti-vaccine material? Yeah, so um, the group I, I created, which has now grown to almost 100,000 people, uh, is what I like to say is the biggest pro-vaccine group on Facebook until some English language group will take, <laughs> take that a crown away. But it is currently. Um, and. Um, uh, I've what I've tried to build there is less of a uh, less of a let's say a place to educate. Well, of course it is that, but also a safe place to ask the questions that may be on 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 the people's minds. So um, people have a lot of questions around vaccination, enormous amounts of questions that I think are very hard to be covered by any medical professional on a in a one to one session. Um, and so when stories come up, let's say it's flu season or it's, it's a pandemic, uh, we have um, you know, a big amount of questions every time uh, there's, a, there's a big surge of people being interested. And um, the only, I think the only long-term plan, because short-term you can do various things like make a video or make a story or write a story or engage the community in some way, but the only long-term plan that works, in my opinion, is uh, creating this place that is known as a as a location that is uh, does not allow misinformation. Specifically, I don't allow people to send a link to some anti-vaccine posting. Ask, you know, what do you think about this? I have no opinion on that. I, I mean, I do have some, a lot of opinions, but I'm not going to put it in a group with with a hundred thousand people where they will see it because it drives uh, engagement. And I'm going to expose a lot more people to the title, which is obviously misleading, than to the comments that I that I can bring and clarify. So I would, I'd, I'd much rather have this place where people are feel safe to ask the question and they know because of the history we've built that they will get a proper answer, sometimes from medical professionals, other times for people who have um, who have um, you know learned the answers because there's very there's a lot of common questions coming up. That's really important work. Uh, someone in the chat asked what the name of the Facebook group is, and maybe we'll end with that. Yes, uh, well, the name is in Romanian, so it's a bit tricky, but uh, it's called Vaccinuri și Vaccinare. That basically means vaccines and vaccination. Uh, and uh, I can share links at some point or uh, uh, provide it. Uh, if, if, I mean, for one good thing for social media is that you can use translation to get the answers and the questions. Uh, so it, it can be used even for non-English non speakers and you know, that's helpful.
Well, great. Then just put that in the chat and then we'll be ready to sure, go. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think we're ready to go to the next the next session. And I'm sorry if right. I'm okay, yes. Uh, as we I'll do. Talk to Kevin, yeah. So uh I have problem with my video, but no, no, we can do it uh, without. Next is uh, you, a video interviewing Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Uh, good to see you again. Hi, um, I wanted to ask. You know, you you work uh, as a writer, a science communicator. I personally admire you, um, but uh, I wanted to know what, how has this last year challenged you? Where, what are you most proud of? What is your, um, how has it, you know, made you grow and what has been very difficult? Um, well, of course, I think some of the difficulties that I've experienced are the same ones that um, all of us kind of share with, um, uh, with the pandemic. Uh, I, I'm, home with my kids all the time. But anyhow, uh, when it comes to my work um, and what I've been focusing on, uh, I think, I wouldn't say I'm the most proud of this, but I'm the most interested lately in um, looking into the roots of what I call the uh, pseudoscience injustices. So um, I've, I've understood, especially over the past few years um, from, from reading research and just my own observations that the purveyors of pseudoscience and misinformation do commit quite harmful injustices. Um, but really they're a reaction to the more powerful injustices that science itself commits um, and to the sexism and misogyny and racism um, and even colonialism that's baked into um, the endeavor of science itself and biomedical research and healthcare. So while homeopathy, for instance, and other obvious forms of pseudoscience are harmful, I think um, perhaps the more crucial pseudoscience to address um, when it comes to vaccine denialism and um, other forms of science denialism is really um, the pseudoscience that comes from within science and, um, and its institution themselves. So for instance, um, there is um, the pseudoscience that is racial biological essentialism. Um, for instance, there are uh, algorithms and decision-making, uh, clinical decision-making tools um, that kind of correct or account for race in some kind of way that um, makes an assumption that different races of people will respond in different ways. For instance, um, you might have heard of a VBAC that's called a vaginal birth after a cesarean section, after someone has a C-section trying to have a vaginal birth the next time. Um, and, and in the uh, clinical decision-making tool that predicts um, if someone will have a successful VBAC, uh, a, in the US, a black person is automatically kind of downgraded in terms of the likelihood they'll have that um, successful VBAC. And that is, of course, because the data that are used to make these clinical decision making tools are observational. If in the US, I mean, it's true in the US. Um, black pregnant people are, are less likely to have a successful VBAC, that doesn't mean that, um, that that's what is going to happen. So anyway, that's, that's one of, of many examples. So what I'm really proud of is the researchers um, in these areas and also the clinicians who are really starting to push back in the last year or so um, against the harmful pseudoscience that is um, happening in science, in research and um, um, and even in the clinic. Wow, that that seems. I mean, it's a it's a big topic by by the sounds of it. Yeah. Um, so, you you wrote about this um, uh, the, this is chapter in your book about Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, who is cooling uh, rapper Bob on him being a flat earther, uh, and there's this um, very star powered kind of way that Neil deGrasse Tyson used. 
um, you know, using some choice words and then a mic drop. Was that good science communication? Was that something that other people should do or is that less good? Sure. Um, yeah, so what Ovidio is talking about is this mic drop. You might remember Neil deGrasse Tyson was on um, some late night TV show because the rapper B.O.B., I think he's American or maybe Canadian. Anyway, he was, um, he was uh, kind of advocating for flat earth theory. Um, so I, I, T Neil deGrasse Tyson's saying is the good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. Um, so I used to really find comfort and even righteousness in that saying, but uh, nowadays it actually makes me cringe. And I, I see this kind of um, barely concealed contempt in that, which I don't think is, um, is the best way to really sway people on science-based issues. Um, and I've seen this view kind of um, becoming more common in the circles of people who do push back against um, vaccine denialism, for instance. And to, to uh, bring back to the topic, um, have governments and communicators uh, done a good job in, in communicating about vaccination and about the pandemic itself? I mean, um, you know, overall, from what you've seen, uh, have, let's say, we'll start with governments, though people will have various experience of their government doing it, uh, and then have science communicators stepped up and said, okay, we need to uh, raise the challenge and, and make something better. I, um, I've seen uh, quite a bit of excellent communication, um, some from the government, of course, in the US, we have uh, the issue right now of, uh, of trusting what some of our agencies say because of the previous administration, but I won't get into that. But uh, overall, bo both from government um, and uh, other science communication um, institutions or individuals who do science, uh, science communication um, have done a really thorough job, I think, in, in some instances, of course, of um, putting out nuanced science-based um, information. I got to give a shout out to, um, to my own group, the SciMoms, SciMoms.com. Um, Dr. Allison Bernstein, she did a great um, detailed COVID FAQ, which I think is quite thorough. So um, I would suggest checking it out. Um, now that's, that's of course a segment of communicators. There are, there's always really bad science communication out there, but to your question, I do think um, there has been a lot of good communication. Now, I think one of the um, fundamental problems um, is the, the idea that communication on its own can really um, put an end to vaccine denialism or any other form of um, science denialism. I think um, institutions behaving in uh, trustful, trustworthy ways, excuse me, um, is, is what can really, really um, move the needle on that. And when it comes to communication, I think one thing that um, could be done better is um, there's this distinction between science literacy and science curiosity. Um, so science literacy, of course, is crucial as, uh, as well as a, a, society, a society that's more scientifically literate. Um, but this distinction between science literacy and curiosity was first established in 2017 by Dan Kahan. Um, and basically what he found is that um, science literacy on its own um, can increase cultural polarization around scientific issues. So in other words, someone with the ability to understand empirical evidence is likely to use it to bolster their existing idea, uh, identity and discard what doesn't suit their worldview. So science curiosity, um, people with science curiosity are more likely to overcome these forces of polarization um, and seek novel information even when it um, contradicts their political views. So I know we're almost out of time, excuse me, but um, I would really encourage um, communicators to uh, think about what can um, increase science curiosity. Okay, let's uh, let's close it there for for time timing reasons. Thank you very much, Gavin.
And uh, then, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so here we have learned a lot. Thank you very much. We'll discuss all this later. Now our last uh, interview is uh, Farah interviewing Noel. So let's go for this last interview. I think you mean that um, I'll be in interviewing Farah. I, I believe that's the correct order. So I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, we go ahead. You're right. Okay. You, okay, you, great. That's what I thought, Farah. but I wanted to make sure. Absolutely. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Great. Okay. So Farah, um, can you share which strategies are most effective in building strategic partnerships um, for immunization interventions at the local level? Sure, thank you so much, Kevin, for this question. Um, it's, a, it's a topic that's really dear to my, um, to, my, to my heart, really. And I would like to have a specific focus on really how to, um, I mean, leverage the resources and the skills that we have within civil society organizations. Um, and, um, and here, I'd like to start by saying that I think CSOs play a critical role in maintaining, restoring, and even strengthening immunization services at, 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 at country level, right? And if routine immunization is known to be the most cost-effective um, um, health intervention that not only saves lives, but also forms strong foundations for, the, for, the, for health systems at national um, level, um, a vaccination program seems to have uh, been a, a little bit victim of their own um, success because I'll, while the mor morbidity and mortality Mortality um, rates have been uh, declining in the past uh, years. So also has the um, the public perception of actually the importance, the very importance of these uh, of vaccine preventable uh, diseases as well. So um, and I think that so because of the, the current context, it's really important that we um, work hand in hand with trusted, and I insist on the word trusted here, with trusted civil society organizations and influencers that will advocate for uh, the importance of immunizations of immunization at country, um, regional, and also global, um, global level. Really, this need has never been uh, um, um, a greater. And as we strive to achieve um, equity in immunization, um, we will need to ensure also that there's a more um, systematic engagement and active engagement of civil society organization and community partners to advocate for um, and also identify those, uh, what we call those uh, zero dose uh, children as well and missed communities rather than having a more of a one-off tactics uh, because it's usually the case at country level. It's more of a, we need to, uh, to, to engage with civil society but only in a very particular and in one instant rather than having a global um, um, engagement uh, strategy. So, but in my opinion, it's really, there's no way to go around um, using there's no way to go around working with um, civil society organization if we want to be uh, successful um, in our um, immunization um, strategies. And as one of the most important principle of um, for immunization is for it to be community owned, right? Um, in order to achieve the um, um, the, obje the objectives of equity and sustainability, um, while it also needs to be country and country led and sustainable as, as well. This also means that we need meaningful participation of communities and civil society organ organizations. So the fact that we really need to diversify the partnership and even change the, the very our, this vision that we have that the that immunization programs are really just uh, um, you know, a matter of uh, the, the government really that that will not be uh, sustainable in the in the long run. And we increasingly also hear of concepts such as uh, putting missed communities first, being, um, you know, having immunization strategies be gender focused as well. And, and both of these require not only the active participation of um, civil society organizations, but also community uh, engagement and ownership really. So to answer your, your question in terms of how do we also just even best uh, leverage the, the, the partnership uh, for um, our, our, our national and regional objectives when it comes to immunization, I think it's also important to see 
um, the, 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 some of the main areas where civil society could have an impact. And to me, those are, are really four. The first one being political will and accountability. Um, here, CSOs can have a critical role to play at, again, global, regional, and country uh, level in advocating and also securing that there's social and political will uh, for equitable and sustainable uh, immunization programs. Um, we, we, and I, I say we because I, <laughs> I work for with Speak Up Africa, and we are a, a CSO, obviously based in in, in Dakar, um, Senegal. And um, here, I think the, the, it's really important that for for civil society to also monitor uh, and and hold government accountable for 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 to their to their commitments and and even to the uh, to the agreed national objectives as well. Um, the second area where I think um, CSOs have also the most um, um, a potential for impact is obviously around um, community demand as well. And here it's very much uh, because um, civil society organizations are uniquely positioned to build communities of trust and confidence because they're closer to them even physically as well. And um, they therefore can have an impact in generating demand for immunization and primary health care um, interventions as well. The third one would be around also complementing public sector deli uh, service delivery. Um, I mean, CSOs can help reach these missed communities by extending the provision of the, the services as well. And finally, the, the fourth one that I would see is the overall um, 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 enabling environment. So how do we, how can we ensure that CSOs have an impact on these strategic enablers? Um, and when I say enablers, I'm really talking about um, even the availability of, of funding, but also training the overall environment that will help to have a uh, a stronger focus on um, on sustainability and uh, and the the very need actually to have uh, children uh, immunized at the country um, at the country level. One thing I would like to and I, I'm going to end with this is the the importance of recognizing that the partnership is um, is uh, diverse, but civil society organization themselves as a group is also not. Um, um, not is also di diverse, right? So it's important that we understand who we're actually um, dealing with, what they can bring to the table, so that we have a more um, um, uh, a more tailored approach that would be that would actually respond to the needs of the uh, um, of the um, of the local context. Great, thank you, Farah. Uh, I mean, I'm sure we could do our an hour for each of us or more asking these questions. Uh, I think okay, I'll ask one. Quick question, maybe you can give your top three for this, but what are the biggest drivers of vaccine misinformation in Africa? And I was going to ask, how is it similar to misinformation in the rest of the world? But maybe you can start with the biggest drivers. All right. So I'll start by saying that um, nature abhors a vacuum, right? So if the right and reliable information is not uh, is not available to a large public, um, it is going to be created somehow. Um, and um, in in this day and age, with the with social media and um, the availability of technology, it's very difficult to consider Africa as a um, isolated case, right? Um, as a I, so, it, we have to consider. The, the, um, we have to consider the impact as a whole and not necessarily for just one society because with the, the available technologies that we now have, information is just really all, all over. So one thing that I'd like to maybe just uh, focus on is the need to, as a, as a driver, would be the need to also change a little bit the, uh, the voices that we hear. Um, the, um, the, 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 the misinformation doesn't really just live on digital or traditional uh, uh, media. So we have seen that accurate information some, some, sometimes was often presented by traditional media, and then it, it was distorted on social media, becoming uh, misin uh, misinformation. But, um, but I think that what would be an important enabler would be to actually hear from a different set of people. Um, and again, I'm going to take um, Africa as an example. We need to hear more from African scientists themselves. I think that this, un unfortunately, um, there's a lot of uh, brilliant uh, African minds that are actually recognized internationally, but within their own home countries, they're not really uh, they're not really recognized. So how do we change that, and how do we uh, find these um, um, empowering and and credible voices in in our own countries who can speak up for research and development and even end vaccines, so that you know this becomes a normal part of our discourse and of our and, and of and the, the narrative at the at the local
local level. I think that too often um, in our communities, we envision uh, vaccines and science as something that's come that comes from abroad um, when there's obviously a lot of research that is happening on the on the continent we need to provide the right platforms to these um, African scientists to also share so that again I think that that will have a great impact on building confidence and ensuring that there's actual trust in uh, what's uh, what's uh, what's being done with the um, with the, um, the the current pandemic I think it was quite um, obvious because in, in, in Senegal, for example, we've heard a lot about alleged death from the vaccine. In, um, in, in South Africa, they, they, they talked a lot about um, in-country vaccine trials. Um, in Kenya, it was more about rum rumors around abortions that were induced because of vaccines as, as, as well. But again, the, 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 the overall narrative was always because it was actually coming from, from abroad. So I think it, we need a fundamental shift in how we actually uh, um, how we actually um, communicate around around science and vaccines in particular. Wonderful, okay. thank you, Sarah. Okay, so now, thank you uh, for this. Um, I think, Farah, you, it's your turn now to interview Noel. Go ahead. My pleasure, nice to have you here, Noel. Um, so you've uh, published hundreds of, of papers on why people actually engage in, in vaccination and other um, health uh, behaviors. Could you um, share your thoughts with us on vaccination as a choice versus uh, vaccination as a behavior? Are these two things the same? Sure. One of the things that really concerns me is that many people when they're talking about vaccination pretend that it really is a choice. And it sure seems like a choice. Someone offers you the vaccine, you say yes or no. But there's a lot of context that makes vaccination not a choice. Is it even available? We've heard about that today in many countries. COVID-19 vaccine is, is not available or measles vaccine was, was uh, under available for a period of time. Uh, it's also unclear whether people can get to vaccination. Can they get time away from work if they have three jobs? Do they have to walk two days to get to the city center in a place the vaccine's available? Many of these things become reframed as choices or as a decision that people make. And I think that's a big mistake. We should be thinking about what, what creates higher rates of vaccination and all of those things, well, not all of those things, primarily those things are around the opportunity to vaccinate. We can think about the drivers of vaccination as being people's understanding, their socialization, and then the opportunity. We need to make sure those opportunities are there through reminding people about what the, what the resource is and making sure that the vaccination centers are clean, that they're welcoming, that the staff are respectful, and that people truly can get the vaccines that they need in a timely manner. Brilliant, that's really fascinating. Um, another question that I'd like to, to, to ask you would be around um, how you think that misinformation actually affects uh, vaccination uptake. It's probably not the main input. And I've heard that from other people on the panel today. I think that's right. There's a lot of things that cause people to get vaccinated. A primary one is when a healthcare provider or a health worker recommends the vaccine. That's a big input. Another is if you've had another vaccine of any sort. And then the third thing is if you merely intend to. Any of those three things will have a big influence on vaccination. Other people's communication can have a role. And as I think you said earlier, if we don't fill the space with information, there's gonna be a vacuum and other people are gonna fill it with misinformation and then it will run wild. We saw that in, uh, in Japan, vaccination fell from 70, HPV vaccination uptake fell from 70% down to single digits in a year because of a, a misunderstanding that the government didn't really get in and address. In um, Denmark, HPV vaccination fell, uh, the rate fell in half in, inside of a single, a year and a half period. Then the government finally got in there and fixed things once they were starting to do their communication it started to, started to have an effect. So it's true that the most influential things that we can do are to support people in getting access to vaccines, having the opportunity. But we also have to be able to tamp down on vaccination misinformation. One potent way that misinformation likely affects vaccination uptake is that it undermines policymakers willingness to support the programs that are effective and the policies that are effective. So that if you're in charge of uh, um, a department of health or human services, and all of a sudden there's all this noise in social media or even traditional media 
you're not going to stand up for this vaccine. You're going to duck and cover. And that's the problem. That's what we need is we need to have strong public advocacy for vaccination that can provide cover for these uh, policymakers and people who run programs so that they can then stand up for their own programs. Brilliant. I think we have a little bit more time. So I'd like to add in a third question here around why you think that communication has such a um, small effect on behavior related to other um, factors such as logistics, for example. And I think you mentioned that a little bit, but if you could go deeper, that would be great. Sure. So we published a paper in 2017 that reviewed everything we knew about trials that had uh, the uh, research studies, controlled research studies that examined how can we increase vaccination. And my money early on was all around communication. For example, fear communication, trying to scare people into get vaccinated. Well, there, it turns out there are 16 studies that had already tried this and all of them failed. They didn't increase vaccination uptake. They scared people a little bit, but it didn't actually change their behavior. Uh, confidence building measures probably have an important role, but it's a bit uneven. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So that's the first chunk of stuff, people's understanding. The second chunk is people's socialization, their social world. What's it like when other people are getting vaccinated or people are telling you to get vaccinated, like, like a provider saying, a, healthcare wor a health worker or a healthcare provider saying, go get vaccinated. That has an impact, uh, but we're not totally sure how to turn that into interventions. But all of these other logistical kind of things seem to really work reliably. And that's things like having an on-site vaccination clinic, bringing it to the school, bring it to people's workplace, um, giving people reminders, giving them automatic appointments. So they're just scheduled by default for a vaccination, for a vaccination visit. All of those things are pretty reliably effective. Brilliant, thank you so much for all of these points, No. Thank you, and I'll, I'll leave one resource here in the chat that I would love people to have access to. And it's uh, a world uh, health- And this, this share with all the panelists, all right. your, your, your uh, resources, please all panelists share with all the participants, sorry. Great. So I've just put in the chat a little link for a report from the World Health Organization on how to deal with vocal vaccine deniers in public. We have two options. One is we can deal with their lies factually, and you can learn the facts about every single vaccine, and it's tiring and it's a bit overwhelming. That does work. Another option is to attack their, their, their argument style, having unreasonable expectations, moving the goalposts, uh, being unsatisfied, no matter what you, what you share, they continue to be unsatisfied. Calling them out on that is as effective as calling out their specific lies. You can actually do both if you have all the information available to you. But if you're gonna be in front of the public and talking about vaccines, you may wanna read this report. This is an effective science-based way to address vaccine misinformation. Thank you so much. I think it's brilliant that we're actually providing very user-friendly uh, resources as well that make sense of the, all of the, um, the, the topics at hand. So thank you so much, Noel, for sharing that. And it's back to you. Thank you. And thank you all of you for your insight and contribution during this interview. We learned so much. Uh, I, we will now jump into small group discussion uh, led by each of you, our dear panelists. You will be assigned into a group shortly, and we are all looking forward to hear your thought and the outcome of your discussion. But also in between, please, all the great resources you have shared among the panelists, put that available for all the participants. They will love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Benaguajo, and to the panelists for that very enlightening conversation. As she mentioned, the participants in the Global Congress will move over to our other meeting for our breakout discussions. And to our public audience, we're grateful that this virtual format enabled you to join today. We've recorded this and it will be available on YouTube later today. And I'll be sending out the link to you. Natalia. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask all our panelists if you can also share all the links that you mentioned on Twitter, because you all have Twitter handles and people can follow you. So please, for everyone who's watching, you can follow our panelists on Twitter. Some of them are very active and I, I'm sure you, you benefit a lot from their wisdom, same as you benefited here, as we all did. Thank you. And we will resume tomorrow with the next public session. Uh, it's at 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and it's on food biotechnologies. 
and GMOs. So we'll look forward to seeing all of you then, and I'll see the Congress participants over in our next session. Thank you again.